I could see where it would be a problem. Disinformation, misinformation, and propaganda I could see where it would be a problem. I mean, if I were trying to conduct international relations between the United States and Russia, and I had Putin via Tucker Carlson basically spewing his propaganda, quote unquote, to a mass audience of Americans, I could see that that would be a problem. What do you think about Tucker Carlson? Uh, I used to watch the opening monologue of Tucker Carlson's show when he was on Fox. Not every night, but, you know, three nights a week. If I was sitting there and it's eight o'clock and, you know, dinner hasn't been served yet or whatever, uh, I, might, I might turn it on. And I found him smart. Uh, I found him provocative. Uh, I, I thought that he was wide ranging in uh, the set of things that he was interested in. Uh, I understand that he has a reputation for being a, a bomb thrower and quirky right wing of dubious character quality. But I, I frankly found him, I thought half the time I'd say to myself, he's right. And how come nobody else is saying the kind of stuff that he's talking about? So I've, I've uh, been favorably disposed toward Tucker Carlson. Uh, and when he uh, broke with Fox and, and went out on his own, I continued to make myself aware of the kind of, kind of things that he's been doing, although I don't follow him religiously. Okay, so the reason I'm asking is I had known about him, but never followed him until he broke with Fox. Well, what caught my eye is first, obviously, when he talked to Putin, I listened to like half of that conversation. But then he talked to uh, the president of El Salvador, Bukele is his last name. And I have a little clip from that, which I'm going to play now. So what's sad about that is that that's a sign that your defense mechanism no longer works. Yes. And that your society is dying. Yes. And Spain is a wonder, in my opinion, a Western wonderful civilization is, is, is reaching a point into it's, it's just, it will start failing. I think that's obvious to those of us with great sadness, to those of us who live here. Un unless things are done, of course. You can, you can, you can always, you can always do, do, do So, stuff okay, two part question. Why do you think that's happening? Because it is recognizably happening in real time before us. And what can be done at this point to reverse it? Well, you know, everything, everything erodes and degrades. I mean, that's, you know, just the loss of, of nature. Yes. I mean, we do, that's why we die. We age and we die. Same happens with anything, infrastructure. At the beginning of the government, I had an argument with, uh, with my Ministry of Public Works. There was this uh, neighborhood that was built in an area that you, you shouldn't build things so there. It was a, a mountain, almost the, 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 the soil was basically flour. The mountain was falling and the houses were falling with the, with the mountain. So to, to save the people, the uh, Ministry of Public Works has started building a huge wall to stop the houses from falling, right? And of course, I, can, I can't micromanage everything. So when I saw the wall being built, I called my minister, I said, what are you doing? I mean, you won't stop the mountain. <laughs> and I said, you should build, let's build houses for, for the people somewhere else. It's, it would be cheaper and, you know, it, he said, no, no, the, 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 wall will, the wall will be fine. We have, you know, uh, engineers from, you know, uh, international corporation and everything. It, it will be fine. So they finished the wall, but I was, I was still angry because I, I thought that it was a huge waste of money and, and, and a lot of risk that if in the future the wall falls, yes. it will be on us because we built it, right? Of course. I started pressuring him. Why do you build that wall? Well, do you build that wall? If the wall falls in the future, it'll be on our, it will be our fault. And I thought he grew tired of me as the pressure. And he said, well, everything that is made by humans needs maintenance. I mean, of course, if we just leave the wall there, fall in 10, 20, 30 years. But if we give maintenance to the wall, the wall won't fall. So that, that is stuck on me, not because of the wall itself, but because everything is like that. Yes. In a relationship, yes, a, that's a plant, right. at home. So Western civilization reached the peak. I, I cannot point exactly where the peak is. It's like timing the market, right? Yes. I'm going to buy in the bottom and I'm going to sell at the top. You, you, nobody can do that, right? And so I don't know exactly where was the peak, but we can all agree that we're in the decline. Yes. So th that is happening because we're not maintaining, we're not giving the correct maintenance to the civilization. There are more substantive and more controversial things said in that interview, but the reason this seemed interesting to me. First, I've known that Bukele became the president and uh, made a lot of controversial moves. On, the only things that I've heard about him were negative. And suddenly he's presented in this very 
favorable kind of position. They're chatting. A lot of this is this like free flow and conversation. He has anecdote from his governance experience and it relates to his views on the world and how the world functions. He talks about the U.S. as a superpower. Sanctions against Russia are not going to work because it also is a superpower. And I had a sequence of thoughts. First, I thought, I want to see other leaders who I'm kind of curious about, but haven't seen present themselves given platform in this kind of way. That would be just as a consumer, it would be very interesting. I would like to hear Malay from Argentina, or I like to hear Modi from India uh, give his pitch his, uh, for what he's doing with his country and how it relates to the world. And then I thought this medium, which is like he's taking podcast into a global scale. He's not doing this hard-hitting journalism, going to ask gotcha questions. He's doing conversation. This genre can, if it picks up, can change the qualities one needs as a world leader, especially if you're like a, a leader of a small country or a country that doesn't get a lot of media attention or a developing country that wants more attention, wants to uh, invite investment or tourism or skilled workers or just have more of a say than you might, like if you're good at podcasting, it may make you an effective leader for these countries. So that's one part that's, that's interesting to me. It's just a, a dynamic that can, if it grows further, can be really impactful. And then the other thing is what Tucker is doing, because I don't know, but I'm guessing for Tucker, the audience back at home is what matters most. And what he's doing here with Bukele is something that he's been doing in other conversation. I have another clip to show with this Russian billionaire where a similar topic is broached and, and Tucker is kind of like introducing this in, in many of these conversations, the decline of the West, the decline of the U S hegemony, which fits with the MAGA movement. You know, you got to make America great again, because it's not great right now. Uh, and so here. It is the U.S. politics, right? He is supporting Trump, for instance, but he's approaching it from, like he's taking it to a, a, a higher level of worldwide conversation. What are different leaders around the world think about the shape the world is in and the place of America or more generally the West in this changing image of the world? So uh, I'll ask you to react to this and I'll, uh, then I'll play another one from Tucker in the same kind of vein, but just to give it a little more texture for how he's building this narrative through multiple conversations. I don't have, I don't think, uh, are any great wisdom here. I have uh, some thoughts. I, I noticed that the President Bukele's English was impeccable. Uh, I think that had to be... Uh, part of whatever the assets are that you're speculating uh, a world leader would require in order to be successful in this medium. Although maybe AI changes that so you get instant translation and so on. <clears throat> uh, I didn't have much uh, reaction one way or the other to the substance of what was being said. And I'm, I admit that I, I wasn't able to hear everything uh, perfectly well in the, in the uh, medium that we were looking at. Uh, but I thought the fact of the conversation, Tucker Carlson, an intrepid, entrepreneurial American journalist with his own agenda, now holding uh, forums in which he does one-on-one -on -one over the head, as it were, of the conventional uh, journalistic media, creating these events, which are these one-on-one -on -one conversations between him and world leaders, in which he exposes his audience to th these uh, leaders directly and not mediated. And I thought that's interesting. And it is, uh, you know, interesting both at the level of Tucker Carlson and what he's doing with his talents uh, in the post Fox environment, it, his program. Uh, interesting in terms of the audiences that are uh, created when world leaders know that they can talk through uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, interview process, they can talk past the uh, diplomatic gatekeepers. They can talk directly. I mean, Putin was talking directly to the audience, whoever it was that was tuning in to, to Tucker Carlson. 
I could see where it would be a problem. This disinformation, misinformation, and propaganda, I, I could see where it would be a problem. I mean, if I were trying to conduct international relations between the United States and uh, Russia, and I had uh, Putin via Tucker Carlson basically spewing his propaganda, quote unquote, to uh, a mass audience of Americans, I, I could see that that would be a problem. So one note on that, apart from Putin getting access to American audiences, Tucker now has access to the Russian audience because his show is now syndicated on the state-owned state Russia 24 TV channel, translated into Russian, not by AI. It's kind of bizarre for me to watch Tucker and Matt Taibbi talking to one another, and there's a, a voiceover translation. I want to raise a question of national loyalty, of, of uh, betrayal of the national interest mm -hmm. in, on behalf of the personal interest when someone like Tucker Carlson with millions of Americans listening to him and following him goes and basically plays into Vladimir Putin's plan, whatever his plan might be, and whether or not there isn't anything to be concerned about in terms of betrayal there. I'm not making the allegation. I'm, I'm, simply, raising, I'm simply raising the question. And how is that like or different from other contexts in which conflicts of loyalties across national boundaries might arise? For example, in the Israel-American uh, diplomatic mm -hmm. axis of uh, national interests that may or may not coincide and individuals who may have a foot on either side of the line and things of this kind. Again, I'm not making an accusation. I'm, I'm just raising a, a question. And whether or not this medium of the internet and uh, social media and global communications and the fact that you can build an audience of hundreds of millions of people that spans national boundaries does, doesn't create a kind of conflict for the nation state. The nation states want to interact with each other in ways that are respectful of their uh, interests, where they conflict and whatnot, but individuals can have relationships that cut across these national boundaries in interesting ways. And the medium permits for a different kind of dynamic for global politics uh, than uh, otherwise might be the case. So for example, I wonder whether or not pro-Palestinian sentiment in the face of the Gaza war isn't enhanced uh, or propagated to some degree or uh, given a different and more effective voice uh, in virtue of uh, what it is that people in the blogosphere, electronic intifada, whatever you might uh, you know, uh, want to call attention to, are, uh, are, are doing. I mean, this is not just Tucker Carlson, that this is, it seems to me a much a much broader uh, set of questions. Your reaction? Like there's a path associated with the journalistic profession, which includes an attempt to be neutral and objective. You know, whether that works in practice or not is a different question, but that's part of the presentation. And I think with this thing, the pathos is more like I might not be objective. I might have my own biases, but the pathos is I'm sincere. You know, you get what I actually think and I'm talking to people and trying to do it in good faith kind of thing. And those are different approaches. And um, again, in practice, both can be false. A lot of journalists who pretend that they're neutral are not. And a lot of, I would guess, podcasters who say I'm sincere are not always sincere. But there is a very interesting dynamic of these two different approaches kind of battling it out. And I think they are kind of pitted against one another where Again, Tucker has a lot of critiques of journalism as a profession. Uh, he, he, he thinks it's in a decadent state. And so he's doing something different that he thinks has its own value. Shouldn't we mention that Tucker Carlson is widely thought to be, and there are hit pieces in the New York Times and elsewhere that document this, a kooky conspiracy theorist, racist, xenophobe? Isn't, isn't he one of the people promoting the great replacement theory idea about uh, immigration, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. So Tucker Carlson is not just anybody. If he goes and interviews uh, 
Vladimir Putin or uh, Viktor Orban or uh, 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 the Modi guy in India or whatever. Isn't he a Steve Bannon type character? Orban will be another one of these. We'll make a good guest. He's not a neutral figure. He, Carlson is an active agent of, of political aspiration and, uh, and activity and influence. He's got a program. He's committed to something. And the thing that he's committed to is not necessarily reputable. That's right. Let me throw this one more clip from him because it's a continuation of the same narrative. So another thing that's interesting here is Tucker constructing a narrative through these interviews that is uh, important for the, the presidential race right now in the U.S. And if this is sustained, is going to be important for uh, how different countries are seen uh, around the world and the sort of dynamics within between them, uh, how the world is changing. So this is this is a Russian billionaire who's under sanctions. Uh, he's going to talk here about the countries he's banned from entering, and I don't think you would see him anywhere in the West. I actually haven't seen him done in, doing interviews in Russia either. Uh, but you wouldn't see him given a platform in Western media and Tucker is doing that and is again advancing this different narrative about what's happening in the world. How many countries are you banned from visiting? European Union, UK, Switzerland, Canada, United States, New Zealand, Australia, that's it. Japan. Japan? To be honest, I'm not sure about Japan. I need to check. <laughs> <laughs> but you, how, so since you live outside what we think of as the no. West, how do you see the world changing now that you've been forced outside the old world into the emerging world? Where's the power coalescing? I think the world is organized now. It's unclear where and what will happen where. Definitely China is growing with incredible speed. I spent uh, quite a lot of time on China lately, and it's amazing. There's an emphasis I notice on building in China, in making things, whereas the emphasis in the West seems to be on banking. What's the difference between a society that builds things and a society that lends money and interest? I mean, at the end of the day, uh, both society trying to resolve the same issue, to make people in this country to feel better. Yes. So uh, there are many ways which lead to the top of the mountain. One society going one direction, another going another direction. Hard to say what's better. Which is a know. stronger society? American. America. Of course. Why? Democracy. Yes. Good history of democracy, rule of law, traditions. Do you think that, and I agree with you completely, I strongly believe in democracy and of course rule of law, but I wonder what the lesson the rest of the world is taking from the last couple of years. I mean, do you think there will be other countries that want to sign on to the democratic project? It's very difficult to say what the democratic project is. Uh, but uh, I mean, we are going through the period of time when dominance of one superpower of the United States, it's, it, will not be, it will not be in future like it was before. Yes. For sure, China done a great, incredible job. And we will see at least two superpowers which will uh, in one way or another, organize world affairs going forward. At the same time, we see a number of the countries who will become strong regional leaders. So we're going to completely different arrangement of the world. Uh, world which is, you can call it multipolar, so, but the world which is this completely different dynamic. That's where we are moving now. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Again, I, I don't think I have a lot of uh, deep insight. I, I don't think Tucker came off looking that well in the interview to be honest with you i think the billionaire sorry uh, i don't recall his name uh was uh was impressive uh I, for example tucker asked the leading question about finance versus manufacturing which which was finessed by by the billionaire who, who basically said you need you need a whole lot of different uh forces to uh, create the capitalist's uh engine's success and you know, he, he, he didn't, maybe he didn't really understand what Tucker was getting at, but Tucker brought his own agenda to the, uh, to the conversation. Uh, as far as the unipolar world is concerned, uh, I'm no expert, but it seems to me obvious that 
what's happening in China is pretty amazing, isn't it? Uh, you know, the, the uh, American century has been over for decades, hasn't it? Uh, and ability for the United States to the indispensable nation to dictate uh, what's happening on the world is, is, is slipping away. Maybe that's a good thing too.